Okay, this is the Stanford, really well-known, famous, great Convolutional Neural Networks for Visual Recognition course. And it's spring 2017, so it's the latest. Now, do you want to do this? Yes, I know the answer is yes, you want to be able to do this. By the, address, by the way, you can look it up here. And all the videos and everything are down here. It has, these are the instructors, and these are all the TAs that put this all together. It's a fabulous course. So I know that you want to do it. So, in order to do it, we have to do this. Uh, they assume that you know this, and if you don't, it's going to be pretty meaningless what, what you do in that course. So we have to do this. This is the book that I gave you called Vector Calculus. The author is uh, very good. This is, a, I, I consider it an excellent, excellent book. So we're going to do it. Here's the instructor, or rather the author. You can see there's some cool mathematics in the background. And we need to do chapters one, which we've basically done that already, actually. We need to do this. We need to know the chain rule in a vector environment, in a vector environment. And we need to know about the directional derivatives and the gradient. We also need to know about vector valued functions, which we sort of touched on a little bit already. Parameterized curves, we, we did do that. I think we did it, we do it up here actually, but anyway. Uh, and uh, the gradient divergence curl and the del operator. Now I'm not sure that we actually need this stuff in this chapter. But this in itself, these first three chapters is a lot. Um, and I don't want, uh, I'm not the kind that wants to skip the details. Because I feel if you don't have the details, you don't, you're not confident with the material. As I said, you need to know this concept, this concept, and this concept in one-dimensional calculus. So this is vector calculus, in other words, multi-dimensional calculus. But you need to know it in one-dimensional calculus. You should not do this material before you've uh, reviewed and made sure you understand very clearly the derivative, or the limits, the derivative, and the chain rule. You can find that in Khan Academy. You can find that in every calculus book. You can find it, I'm sure, hundreds of places online. But you need to do it carefully. Okay, let's start. This to the students, some prelim preliminary uh, notation. So I think everybody knows what this means. But let's read it. A union B is this. This is read as the set of all A. This set of all A, and then this line is read such that X is an element of A, or X is an element of B. Well, that's exactly what you would think of the union means. And here's the intersection. The only difference is that we're going to change this word to and, and that will give us the definition of the intersection. This notation means A is a proper subset. Uh, well, actually, so in some books this means uh, proper subset, and this means just any kind of subset. The difference between proper and any kind is we could write in this one A and put A here also, and that would be true, whereas you, sh you wouldn't do that here. A is a proper subset of A. No, that's not true. So anyway, you can look up the definitions of the difference, but there's not, it doesn't matter for us. Okay, we know what this means. This means the real numbers or the real line. We know what this means. This means uh, two-dimensional space. Uh, we know about this, of course. There's a point there. We know what this means. We've done this. This is all from, we've done much more advanced stuff than that. Um, reviewing the concept of the derivative, but I want you to do this more carefully than we're doing right here. But this is the definition of the derivative. You can see it involves the limit concept, so you need to know the limit. That's why I said you need to know limits. And this is a one-dimensional uh, derivative, and it's usually written as f prime, or that's one of the notations. Uh, here they're saying that um, you know, we could write x, y, and and the positive z direction could be down down here, 
but we don't do it that way. We put the positive z direction in this direction. So you know, it's, you could have certainly said, you know, by po uh, positive z's go down this way, but we don't. We say positive z's go this way, and um, that's called uh, right-handed rule. So if you use your right hand going from x to y, then your thumb points in the positive direction of z. Whereas if you used your left hand, you went from x to y, you would point down that. But we don't use that rule. We use the right-handed rule to find the positive direction of z. And uh, this picture just says that the point 2, 4, 5 in three dimensions is, uh, let's see, I guess 2 doesn't look right. Okay, yeah, it does look right. This is 2 in this direction, in the x direction, 4 in the y direction, and 5 in the z direction. We point out here that what the derivative means in one dimension, in, um, sorry, in one input variable, uh, is that we have a curve f, which is the blue curve, and the derivative tells us the slope of the tangent line. Okay, we don't need the integral, so we're not going to do that. That does also come in uh, calculus, but we don't need it for what we're doing for convolutional neural networks. Okay, a partition, just quickly, uh, of this is, remember that this means an interval, means like from here's A, maybe, and here's B, means all the points in between A and B, um, and a partition of this interval is uh, just a set of points x1, x2, x3, and so on that are between A and B that basically split up that interval into pieces. That's called a partition of A and B. Sorry, that's called a partition of the interval from A to B. Okay, that was just a brief review of some of the very basic concepts that you do need to know. Uh, and now we're going to start with Chapter 1, Vectors, which we have studied very extensively already, much more extensively than is done in this book, but uh, the, this book does a nice job of what it, what it covers, so it's worth looking at it. It's like it's a good review, or it gives you a different view of what we've learned already, maybe, but not nearly as deep as what we've learned. So it says a vector in R2 is simply an ordered pair. So this is, remember, I mentioned this in our class once, that this is the um, algebraic definition of a vector. In other words, it's not the geometric idea. This is divorced from the picture, from the arrows and the picture and all that stuff. It just says uh, a vector in R2 is just an ordered pair. No arrow. I know there's no mention of arrow here. There's nothing about arrow. We're not talking about arrows. Just saying a vector is this. For example, 1, 2, or this. Okay, a vector in R3 is an ordered triple. So this, for example, this, are, is a vector in R3. She explains that we're going to use boldface to indicate vectors, so that this will be a, a small uh, letter with a boldface will be a vector. So here's a vector, this one. Here's another vector. Here, we're calling, it, we're calling this the same vector. And we're giving it also the name A, and there, this one is in R2, and this one is in R3. And um, she also says you can put an arrow over it like that. That's sometimes easier when you're writing on a board, or when you're writing by hand, than tr trying to make something bold. And uh, she says to contrast with vectors, we will also refer to, a sing to single real numbers, as scalars. So just a number is called a scalar as opposed to a vector which is an ordered pair like this. Okay, so the first thing we do with vectors is we ask what do we mean by saying that two vectors are equal? So equal, what do I mean if I say that this vector a is equal to this vector b? It means that they are element by element equal. That is, it means that a1 must equal b1 and a2 must equal b2. And of course, similar for uh, our three vectors being equal. So first we give a meaning to the word equal. So for that reason, we say that this is equal to, A is equal to B, because these are obviously equal to these, right? But these are not equal. Because the, now you might say, aren't these, isn't this one 
equal to this because it has the same numbers, but no. They have to be equal element by element, so these are not equal. Okay, the next thing we do is we say, what do we mean by adding two vectors? We give a definition for adding addition of two vectors. So we know this already, but just to review. And remember, we haven't brought in the pic anything having to do with pictures for vectors and no arrows or anything like that yet. So how do we add two vectors with just the algebraic, from just the algebraic point of view? So we have a vector a, for example, in, in R3, and another vector b in R3. Then to add them, what do we mean by this symbol, adding them? We mean add them element by element. So a1 plus b1, comma, a2 plus b2, comma. So this is also in R3, and that is what we mean by the addition of a and b. So you can take this one and this one and add them, and so on. Okay, and then we discuss properties of vector addition. So a plus b equals b plus a. Now you can easily show that. Given the definition of addition, you can show that this is true. You have to write a as like a1, a2, and b, or suppose we're doing it in R3, a is a1, a2, a3, and b is b1, b2, b3, and um, so that's what they're doing here, actually. So here, you can see the proof of that, because here you write a plus b, which is this, but we're allowed to switch the order of each one individually, because these are just numbers inside there. So we're allowed to switch the order of those. So because um, scalar addition is what we call, what is this called, commutative, because of that, because scalars are commutative, scalar addition is commutative, that leads to the fact that uh, vector addition is also commutative. Okay? And the zero vector, this is the zero vector. Scalar multiplication means you take a, a real number like k and you multiply it times this, k times a, and this is what we mean by k times a. Okay, that should be a review. Here's an example. properties of scalar multiplication, so I didn't read all of these. This is also true, this is called associativity, and uh, the zero vector a plus zero equals a. Okay, we can prove these, these properties. And it, it's good, actually it's good kind of practice to prove them, Use in the, in the same way that uh, we just proved that this is equal to this, you can prove the other ones as well kind of good practice to do it. It'll give you, if you do it, it'll give you some confidence. Okay, scalar multiplication like this. Properties of scalar multiplication you can also prove these. Okay, I'll leave it at that. Okay, then now we take a geometric idea of what we mean by vector. So we have a point like that, we have a point like that, But we can also, uh, instead of just the point, we can talk about the blue arrow here as being the vector, or the blue arrow here in R3 as being the vector. And I guess this is somehow use, uh, pretty useful in physics. In that case, we can talk about the length of the vector, that's called the magnitude. And we can also talk about the direction, which is the angle. One thing to remember is that the zero vector is still a vector, but it doesn't have any magnitude and it doesn't have any length. I'm sorry, it doesn't have any direction. Now, vectors like maybe even uh, came from the uh, from physics. I mean, maybe that's why people started to use vectors for explaining some kind of physics. And anyway, it's, uh, there's a long history of vectors in physics. And um, they say, in physics, one doesn't demand that all vectors be represented by arrows having their tails bound to the origin. So these are all vectors. In fact, these are all the same vector. That's kind of a weird thing, but um, these are all the same vector, so in, at least for physics. So what do we mean by two vectors being the same? So normally we say, you know, we talk about a vector as being, having to be begin at the origin, 
But if we allow them to float around, then what do we mean by the fact that they're the same? So we mean that they point in the same direction and they have the same length. So like if this is A, then what about this? Can this also be A in, this, in that sense? Well, as long as the length is still the same as the length here, and as the direction is still the same as this one, then we'll say that it's the same vector. Now, actually, that goes a little bit against what we just said earlier when we said, what do we mean by two vectors are the same? So this is actually kind of contradictory. Let's see how that shows up. Like, when, did, when will this cause us confusion? Because it's actually contradictory what they're saying here. Right now they're saying that this is the same as this. What we just said, that two vectors are only equal when they have the same coordinates, but these clearly don't have the same coordinates. So this is already, a, there's a contradiction here. Let's follow it through and see when it's going to make us get confused. But anyway, let's, let's, let's leave it at that for now. Now you're familiar with the fact that um, we already talked about what we mean by adding two vectors. Now if we picture those two vectors, then it turns out that um, their sum, when you picture them, is the same as taking the first one and then taking the second one, putting the base of it at the tail of the first one, and then extending it up here, and then drawing this line turns out to be the same thing as the sum that we just defined before. We de defined just a few minutes ago what we mean by adding two vectors. This will work. This will do the same thing. Um, that's called the, uh, well, there's also the parallelogram rule, which is instead of doing it the way I just said, which is do this and then this to get this, you can also do this and then this and then draw the this thing in the parallelogram. And this is still, so it's just another way of visualizing what we mean by A plus B when we're talking about these arrows. You can, I'm, I'm sure you can see that if you do it this way, or if you do it this and this and this way, you're going to get this thing is still going to be the same in both cases. Okay, beyond just uh, adding two vectors, what does multiplying a vector mean? And we talked about that. When we multiply A times 2, it doesn't change the angle but it does change the length, the magnitude. And here we have a and b, and what do we mean by a minus b? So here's a minus, according to this picture, according, if they're right, if they've drawn this right, this is a minus b. In that case, where does a minus b start? The vec this is a vector, and they're calling it a minus b. Where does it start? Well, obviously it starts here. And where does it end? It ends here. So A minus B starts where? Does it start at, at the end of A? No. Does it, where does it start? According to just the picture, where does it start? It starts here at the end of B and goes to the end of A. So that's a little, like, kind of, a little confusing. Like, shouldn't A minus B start at A and go to B? No, that's not. At least not according to this picture. Now, why is it true? Because if you take a minus b and add b to it, what should you get? Well, if I take a minus b and put a plus b here, what should I get? Well, the minus b and the plus b cancel, I just get a. So that means that if I take a minus b and add b to it, so if I take d b plus a minus b, what should I get? We just said I should get a, and that is what you get. So you can see that this is the right picture. This is where a minus b is. It doesn't go from here to here, it goes from here to here. Okay? But it somehow looks confusing. Okay, next thing, they define something called the displacement vector from two points. So suppose P is one point, which is actually a vector, but they're calling it a point here. Suppose I'm sorry, P1, and suppose P2 is another point, then the so-called displacement vector is this minus that, this minus that, this minus, so it's the difference between this, these coordinates, and these coordinates. So what is the displacement vector? Well, here's P1, and here's P2, and this is actually, the displacement vector is also what? If you think of P1 and P2 as vectors instead of points, if you think of them as points, then, they, then it's called the displacement vector. 
if you think of P1 and P2 as vectors, then what is the displacement? Well, it's the same thing as here's P, let's say this is P1 and this is P2, or the, yeah, then what is this arrow? This is the displacement vector, but it's also uh, P1 minus P2. So the displacement vector is also P1 minus P2. If you're thinking of P1 and P2 as vectors, they're not. They're thinking of them as points here. Okay, here's an example of where vectors might arise in a, in a kind of physics uh, problem. So suppose a particle, which is sitting here, uh, is located at point at the point A1, A2, A3. So it's sitting here with respect to some coordinate system. Here's the coordinate system, so here's the point. And uh, if um, then it has a position vector here, okay? If the particle travels with constant velocity v, so v is a vector. So that means it, it's, a, it's an arrow. It, that means it indicates a direction and also a, a magnitude. So v is somewhere. So let's suppose this is v. Now again, we could draw v over here we could draw it anywhere in here, but we're going to draw it at the tip of A because we're saying that the point is starts at, at A, starts here, and then moves in the direction of V. So it makes sense to put V here. So um, the question is, for T seconds, then the particle's displacement from its original position is TV. So if it moves in one second, it moves this far. In two seconds, it moves double, and in general, it moves TV. And the new coordinate, therefore, is what? It's going to be the initial position plus TV. So A plus TV. Okay, there are other examples here, but let's go on to chapter section two. More about vectors, the standard basis. So we talked extensively about bases. This is the most basic idea as a basis, so this is nothing compared to what we did already. But in R2, the vectors 1, 0, and 0, 1, called i and j, play special notational role. Any vector can be written in terms of i and j. Well, I think we saw that, I think we said this in terms of linear algebra, we said that if i and j uh, span the span R2, then every vector in R2 can be written as a linear combination of i and j. That's what this is saying. So here's a1, a2, and we can write this, of course, like this, for this one plus this one. But that, the first one, this one, can be written as a1 times 1, 0. But what is 1, 0? That's i. And what is uh, 0, 1, that's j. So we can write it as, we can write this like this, and then those two like these two, but then that's I, a1 times i plus a2 times j. So we've shown that this can be written like that. Every vector in R2, this is just an arbitrary vector in R2, can be written as a linear combination of i and j. That's called a basis for i and j. That's called, the, and, and this particular basis is called, what did I say? That's a basis for R2, and uh, this particular basis, I and J, is called the standard basis for R2. So here's another example. Here's a vector A. We can write it as A1 times I plus A2 times J plus A3 times K. Okay? So also in R3, if we have a vector like this in R3, we can write it like A1i, A2j, A3k, just that's what we saw up here. Okay, parametric equations of lines. So here we have a picture, and this is R2, and y equals 3 means this line here. In R2, the equation y equals 3 defines a line. 
in R3, the equation y equals 3 de describes a plane. So it's all the points that have coordinates y equal to 3. Well, here's maybe 3 for on the y-axis. So imagine ev all the points that have a y-coordinate of 3, and that forms a plane, which this is supposed to depict that plane. Okay, the next thing is parametric equations of lines, which we also covered, but I'm going to review it quickly. And after we do that, what else do we have to do? We did all of this, but we have to, we should do it again. We saw before in our class that using parametric equations, we're going to be able to give the equations for this weird looking curve um, kind of easily, which is otherwise probably quite hard to figure out what it is. But using parametric equations, we're going to be able to do it fairly easily. And that will finish parametric equations, which we'll do in the next video. Then we will cover the dot product, which we've certainly done. Remember the length of a vector. Well, the dot product, you remember, is easy, actually. If you have two vectors a and b, like this and this, the dot product is like that. And with that, we can talk about the length of a vector a, and it's going to be the dot product. This is inside here is the dot product of a with itself, and then the square root of that. That's what we're going to mean by the length. Now, does that correspond to the? You know, we have a we have a natural idea of length, right? Length of a of a vector, right? We should know what the length of a vector means. I mean, we have an intuitive idea of that. Does this work? with that intuitive idea. Well, it, it will. It certainly will. Okay. All right, we're going to do that. And then that's going to actually allow us to talk about the angle between the vector, between two vectors, which will turn out to be this. Now, we did this before, but we'll do it again. And next, we'll do vector projections, which means here's a vector b, and we want to project it um, onto into the direction that A is. So we have a vector B, and we want to know what's its projection onto A, or onto the direction of A. So in other words, it's like, what would you get if you took a light and shined it vertically down here? What shadow would it cast? That's called the projection of B onto A. Even though A doesn't actually extend all the way here, still we talk about the projection of B onto A, means on into the direction of A. So this vector from here to here is that is that shadow. So that's called the projection. Here's another example. Here's A. What's the projection of B onto A? Well, it doesn't even, you know, it's not even touching A. But what we mean is if you took a light and shined it down here, what would the shadow be? Obviously, the shadow would be here. And that's called the projection of B onto A. So this notation, you know, you have to remember it. I can can get it confused. Like I'll say, you know, maybe I, maybe this means the projection of A onto B. But no, it means this means the projection of B onto A. Okay, so you have to learn that notation. And then we're going to show a formula for the length of the projection of B onto A. And it's going to turn out, we can write it in terms of the dot product and the length of A. Okay. Now, does this make sense? I mean, I don't, I don't know if it makes sense or not, but I just want to check one thing. The projection of B onto A is a vector. So this part inside is a vector, but then we put it inside these things. So that means we're taking the length of that vector. So on this side, this is a length. Is this also a length? In other words, this side is not a vector, it's a length. Is this side also not a vector, but a length? Well, yeah, on the top, we get a dot b. That's a number, and we can take the absolute value of that number, which is what they do. And then this is a vector, but when we put it inside here, that's also a number. So we get a number divided by a number, which is a number, not a vector. So this is a number, and this is a number, so at least that part makes sense. But anyway, we have to go through this and make sure that this is correct. And then we have this formula also, which isn't just the past, the previous formula just told us the length, 
of the projection. Where was that? That was here, the length of the projection. But this tells us not the length, but what the vector is, actually. So let's just make sure this makes sense. So this, being the projection, is a vector, right? Let's make sure we remember that. Here's a projection. That's a vector. It goes from here to here. So this is a this means a vector. So this is a vector. Is this a vector? Hmm. Doesn't look like a vector. Or maybe it does. I don't know. Let's check. What's a dot b? Is that a vector or a number? The dot product gives you a number. What's this thing? Inside is a vector, but when you take the this is called the norm of a. When you do that. What do you get? That's a number. Also, number squared is still a number. This is a number over a number. Okay, that's a number. This side was a vector. Looks like something's wrong. But we're taking this number times a. a is what? Is a vector. So it's a number times a vector. It gives us a vector. Okay, at least this is a vector and this is a vector. But anyway, we still have to verify this formula and then also this formula. And then we have to go on to, these are applications which we don't necessarily have to do for what we want. Then we have to go to the cross product. We'll do that. And that will uh, introduce us to this thing which we've talked about, which are called determinants, but we'll, have, we'll do that. And then we have some more stuff. Okay, this is properties of multiplication, properties of dot product, proper properties of cross products. Okay, and then, okay, then we get to kind of more fun stuff, I guess. Equations for planes dis and distance problems. So we did do this before also. We're going to get the equation of a plane using vectors. And we did some of this stuff. Parametric equations of planes. I think we did that. Distance between planes. Dis that was distance between Parallel lines, distance between two skew lines. What are skew lines? Whatever, they're not parallel. Okay. And then, are we ever going to finish this? Some n dimensional geometry. Okay. This is very much similar. Uh, standard basis, we've talked about that, but we'll go through that more stuff. Matrices, we've certainly talked about matrices. Column vectors and row vectors. Matrix addition, all this stuff, we've done it. Uh, the, um, what's this, the transpose, hyperplane I saw, right, it means a, a kind of a plane but it's in Rn. Here's, this might be interesting. This is a, um, an, ex an, an example from economics. We have n commodities and the price and so on for all these commodities. So we'll, we'll take a look at that. Determinants. I wonder if we're able to finish this chapter. New coordinate system, okay. Okay, so this uh, we didn't talk about really. But this will turn out to be useful at times. And uh, it's a, a different way of identifying where a point is. So here we have the x and y axis. And we talk about where is this point? Well, how many? You have to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 in this direction. And 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 in this direction. So we'd say it's at 5, comma 5. That's one way to locate a point. But we could use a different coordinate system. And this, also, this comes from physics. I mean, I think they thought it, for some reason, this was useful in physics. It makes 
sometimes the math easier. Um, so instead of saying this is at like x comma y, we could say it's, we could talk about the, the vector and the angle of the vector and the length of the vector. So now they extended this up to here, but really, I don't know, it kind of looks confusing. They're just trying to show the ang the direction. But anyway, we could identify a point by um, the angle that it forms with the x-axis and then the length to the point. So that's called the polar coordinates of the polar coordinates of the point as opposed to the um, what are the other one called? The Cartesian or rectangular coordinates. So you can do that with any point. You can say you know, this point or this point or this point or whatever point, every point, you can talk about what are its polar coordinates. Now here, they haven't identified the polar coordinates. These are the rectangular coordinates. But I think in this example, it's going to turn out that expressing this, or maybe this is, no, sorry, these are not the rectangular coordinates, or is it? I think these are the polar coordinates, so forgive me for that. So what we're going to do is, instead of having x and y, we, we can have an equation with r and theta, and we can ask, you know, what, and just like if you had x and y, like, suppose you had y equals x plus 5, that's an equation, that will give you some line in, the, in r2, right? So y equals x plus 5 will give you some line. So maybe this will give you some kind of shape as well. And we could ask, wh wh what shape does it trace out? In other words, when theta is 0, what is r? When theta is something else, what is r? When theta is something else, what is r? So you're going to get certain pairs of theta r's, which are going to give you different points. And maybe, you know, you can figure out what that, all those points, what the shape is of all those points. So they say, I don't know what they say, but we'll see it. And then we also ha can say, we can make, um, if we know um, r and theta of a point, we can figure out what x is. And if we know r and theta of a point, we can figure out what y is. So these are ways to translate. If you know the polar coordinates, you can figure out the x and y coordinates and vice versa. If you know the x and y coordinates, you can figure out the r and you can figure out the theta. So this is a way to translate between coordinate systems. Okay, so we have to do all this to finish chapter one. Okay, so it's going to take a couple hours to go through all of this, but we need to do that. Once we finish chapter one, we will start with differentiation or derivatives in several variables. So. Um, like I said, you need to know derivatives in one variable very well before you start this. Okay, so we just do a number. Chapter 1 is like uh, setting up all these basic concepts that we can now use uh, in, to talk about differentiation in several variables. Okay, so we're going to do that. And the most important thing for us is this word here, the gradient. And then in Chapter 3, Section 4, the gradient divergence curl and the del operator. So we need that at least. And we need one more thing, and that's called the Jacobian. But that comes fairly straightforward from, from this stuff. So once we get to here, we'll be basically finished. Okay, so I'll stop this now. And uh, we will finish Chapter 1 and then have to do chapter 2.